Welcome, Dr. James Beckett Sports Card Insights. Thanks, sponsors, Tops Panini, Upper Deck, Heritage Auctions, Huggins to Scott Auctions, Mike Stadium Sports Cards, Burbank Sports Cards, Compsy.com, Beckett Media, Beckett Grading, Beckett Authentication. Here's another segment of the Hobby Content Creators Dinner about marketplaces. Next, they have a business model. And deep in, embedded in the announcement was that the leagues and the player associations and fanatics, they, they want to be sharing even in the secondary market which is where the big bucks are, I think, mm-hmm. in this industry, not off the line, uh, unopened. How do you get involved in a, a card that, once it gets out of their hands, gets sold over and over again? And how do they... Two ways. One is blockchain. There's a chain of custody, and it, that requires the non-physical card, I think. And the second way is to control the marketplaces. Finance has its own marketplace. auction site that they've had testing for as long as they've lived, practically. How's that goes full-blown, and then you just offer really cheap rates to consign your product or whatever you have. They've sold you back to them. Doesn't and stop the, the, the card shows, right? No. It it, it's the same thing as you look at ComC, PWCC, or Popstein. They just become another arm, which takes from everyone. To Brian's point from before, could Fanatics not buy ComC? Could they not buy PWCC? Starstock, anybody, Beckett Marketplace, put them all together, they have the cards coming and going. I, I was looking at it from a different viewpoint. Most mornings, I walk at Willow Bend Mall. Fanatics owns Lids. Yes. There's a lid store right next to the food court. When I walked by it, I started envisioning redesigning the store slightly to put a card section where it, not just selling caps, but in a good retail location that they've already owned selling cards in an already established retail location. You can advertise it, and as the new products come out, you can sell some of it at a retail location that you already are paying the rent. That's just one example of using what you already have to sell more product. I was thinking that's a brilliant move that all of a sudden you've got all these places that exist that are selling your product already, just add another division because if they're coming in to buy caps with sports logos on it, they're already sports people. You use it to to have a a drop-off for consignment. Yeah. You instantly have a store in okay. every neighborhood that anybody could reach, that they literally just drop it off. No mailman involved. It's just, you dropped it off so the store. So like fulfilled by Amazon, you fulfilled yes. by mm-hmm. Fanatics. Mm-hmm. Except with poor customer service Exactly. Most likely an uneducated well, staff. Uh-huh. Because anyone who knows anything about cards can make a lot more money than working at Lids. Uh-huh. Probably. But the breakdown is because of the skews. There's millions of cards. Unopened product. Yes. But that's There's, what I'm thinking that's about. What, that's what will happen in the that's Lids. That's what I think about. It's but just if somebody open. comes in and says, I want an 87 McGuire, a certain you, person. You put barcode on every single one, or QR code on every single one of your cards. Easy. You scan it in the system. Well, or something similar. But I would rather just start with an open. Why do singles? That's not going to be, you're not going to want to do 1987 Mark McGuire second year card, but you are going to want to do 2026 Fanatics Chrome or whatever the term is and sell the boxes in your store already. You're not going to want to deal with singles cards. You just want to deal with the unopened there. Maybe you'll have another place where. But maybe they do because (laughs) once the cards get opened, and it starts churning. Secondary. That's where the secondary market is about mostly individual cards. There was a lot of action for unopened, but once they get opened, I think Fanatics and the leagues want to get a piece of that too. And they can probably set up places thereof to do that too. Or Fanatics owns other places. You can, yeah, you, Brian, you're right. Most of the people, but if you have, as Angela says, QR code, all the codes, they don't have to be real smart to sell the cards. I'm not sure they really want the money from the single cards. I think what they want is they don't want boxes to be a hundred dollar factory cost Mm -hmm. and distributors sell them for 300 and stores sell them for 700. They, that is a problem. Demand's too big. We can't make more products. None of us can. It's a big problem. We can't make more. So that's the secondary market. I think that's the secondary market. That's the easy money. And how you do that is you crush people in our hobby. That's how you make the money they need. Well, no, I'm saying here's how you do it. You cut out the distributors because they're making a lot of money. You cut out retail stores. Why would you let the retail store make that margin when you've got the best website in the history of sports? When you control, you can tax. That's the All problem. All they have to do is serially number and make unique numbers for each box. So if it's registered and you sell it with a $400 markup, you've got to give them 100 bucks or whatever. I think they want all the money. I would not be they shocked if they want it all. And as a loyal, addicted, crazy base that we are, we're going to pay them probably.
Because okay. we're already paying the distributors and the dealers. Tax. They, That's scary to me to think that stores could be in jeopardy when people are going out opening stores right now. Because people are spending like, their life savings to open stores. These people have to really think about the pivot because the stores and the distributors, their business models are at risk. David Adams and Blowout Cards, their business models are at risk. Every one of these guys' business models are at risk, and it may turn out just fine. They may step up and say, look, this is a great system. Let's keep this system. We'll just raise all the prices to try to get the juice out before it gets to the public. But I'm telling you, everybody needs to be thinking about this because there's going to be a lot of dancing that's going to have to happen because everybody is at risk. And the great thing is Fanatics hasn't said one word at all. We have no clue. That's the beauty of this. We're just speculating. But the whole distribution model is at risk. And I think single cards are the least of our problems. There may not be anybody we know to sell them where we live. We may have to go on the Fanatics site and buy them. That's the scary part. I hope it doesn't go to that. But that really may be the only you can buy cards now because mm -hmm. Fanatics, they have an incredible distribution system. The best website ever. They've got everything they need to take the process from day one to day 30, and it's over. That's a big picture thing we got to get our arms around. The good news, I'm optimistic that the world's not over, that it will turn out somewhere in between. So but it could be really they're, bad. They're rational, but they're monopolists. I think they want and need to make every penny possible, and their partners definitely are going to want to. The idea that a distributor could make 50 or $60 million a year, as I heard Ken Golden quote, mm -hmm. if that's true, they're not going to be okay with that. And that's what people who have strong market positions do. They decide what people are allowed to make. You decide what's okay for people to make in your food chain, or you just take them out of the food chain. And we have to really just be open-minded again, not be negative, but just be aware that there's risk all over the place. Fortunately, it'll probably be somewhere in between. We've done a lot of work to build this thing. We paid our dues, and it's all at risk for almost every person. Because what's the show going to look like if there's no wax, or if prices from the manufacturer are doubled or tripled? Everything can change how it looks, and you just have to be open-minded to what new things could look like, like no logos. You have to have that same kind of open-mindedness, right? You've seen everything, Dr. Beckett. Yeah, I'm just concerned that the dollar boxes are going to be three dollar boxes. <laughs> 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 You're going to have to give them yeah, yeah. too. Hey, with the way these inserts are, you may have boxes where you get like one card every six boxes. <laughs> Five of them are empty for all this thing to go anywhere. <laughs> well, the, the future of a marketplace is, you were talking about eBay, and I, I know that uh, Jeff's probably more an expert on this because you're a partner. Sponsor. They seem like they're very active in consolidating and cleaning up the, the space and adding more technologies. It seems like they're very active in, in making it a better place to surf. I don't know who else would be doing that, but it seems like they're actively doing something. I, I communicate with eBay consistently. They are very consciously trying to be active in the hobby more so than they have been. They have a lot of intention to be in part of community. I, I only see this as causing eBay to want to be even more so active and being quote unquote the original for the, the people that have been around in the hobby forever, that you can trust eBay, you can work with eBay, like eBay would be your best friend at this point in time. I will say for card shows, because I know that was one of the things that you brought up, I might be wrong on this on economics, but in, in my opinion, if Fanatics is trying to control the secondary market in the sense that they're trying to hold boxes, I think that as somebody who's making the boxes, you're aware of which products could probably sell for more. So you're more likely than not going to take those rare elite national treasure like boxes, make them very expensive, and that's your price point. But they don't fluctuate. So that's the price point. That's what it is. So if people buy that box, I think card shows would actually be way bigger than what they are now because you're not then dealing with fanatics. You're not dealing with going and paying the fees, the fanatics fees, the eBay fees, or any of those types of fees. You're doing in-person dealing and you have possibly the ability to buy cards for cheaper than you would have it on fanatics. It's the same thing that I see every time we go to these card shows, we pull up comps, we see how expensive they are, and then you negotiate. I think in that sense, you're putting the power in the actual collector's hands, the investor's hands, whatever you call yourself, you're putting the power in the person's hands to make their own deal. I think you're just going to end up seeing a lot more card shows and a lot more people at tables with singles, maybe less wax, but definitely more singles, definitely more cards that they want to try and wheel and deal because then they're taking 100% of that profit and they're not working on a secondary market with consignment. Fair. I like that. You're talking about people looking for other means to save money or not spend as much as if fanatics were to monopolize the industry. Oh, it's also looking at sticking it to the man. <laughs> yeah, but I'll be honest with you. PSA showed me what this industry is about. They jacked those prices up to areas I never fathomed <laughs> possible. And at the national, people were paying $600 to get one single card grade. I never thought I'd see anything like that. So that's proof positive. People are gonna pay whatever 
it takes to get what they want. Yeah, if they think they can make money on whatever it is, they're going to just pay whatever it takes, whether it's out of their savings or credit card or sell a kidney, whatever it yeah. takes. You know? Hopefully not. But, uh, it's it's the unfortunate proof that we are shifting from a hobby to a business. Mm -hmm. We have shifted, but now even those most in denial are having to come around. And the people opening stores are not young hobbyists who just had a few bucks and love collecting cards. They're smart people with a lot of money. I met with people at the National, they're so smart. They're Ivy League or elite school grads who said, I can make money in this market because of its inefficiencies. And those inefficiencies may have just changed. And the whole rules have changed. Over not, not yet, we have five years notice, but, <laughs> but they're changing. Kelly's acting like it's gonna be a little more commoditized. There'll be a price, there'll still be an opportunity for a little bit of negotiation, but if the price of the unopened box is the price mm -hmm. from fanatics and they really control it, then it takes away some of the dynamic element that we see now. Again, we see the ugly side of it when people can charge more, but, but I mean, part that's of the a charm of the industry is that it's a little bit disorganized, a little bit unregulated. Yeah. I tell people all the time that the card business doesn't operate like a normal business and adding fanatics just makes it act more like a normal business rather than a card business, which is just, which has is some oddball rules to it. Yeah. We didn't used to see that price inflation on wax 10 years ago. No. Your manufacturer suggested retail price is what it would sell for. This is the, the only industry where your inventory appreciates. And if you raise the price of something, it increases the demand. Yeah, I think the yes. point is that. <laughs> and if you did it great and it grades well, it's even more. Another bump. Uh, yeah. I mean, Actually, the most fair way to, to do this all is what StockX did about a year and a half ago with Bowman as an experiment with a Dutch auction, but it wasn't the way that Panini's currently doing their Dutch auction. It's a real <laughs> awful, it was a fair Dutch auction where they had a thousand boxes for sale and whatever the thousandth bid was the price that everybody, everybody paid. That's so what it a was Dutch an, auction used to mean. Yeah, mm -hmm. I thought that was an extremely fair way of doing it. By the way, that entire sales strategy was created by Josh Luber. And I talked to him extensively and he, he said, Jeff, this is the future of how wax is going to be sold. We're going to do this test run with Tops, and Tops is going to love this, and Panini's going to love this. This is going to be the future. Like, we're going to get them on board, and, and we're going to do these IPOs of wax releases for all these major products. That was his vision. And he could never get Panini and Tops along for the vision. They only did it that one time, and then they never did it again. He couldn't get Tops on board. He couldn't get Panini actually decided, oh, we're going to make a lot more money out of it by going with you pay what you pay, and there's no refunds, and then it finally sells out. I would not be surprised if when Fanatics comes out that that is how all wax is sold. But, but you're right, it brings up a very interesting question about card shops and all that stuff. There's two, two questions. Number one, for you, if you do this IPO, you realize the Prism Basketball IPO is $40 million or $50 million or $60 million. We've never had to have that much liquidity shoved into a one or two week period and organize sell in one place. Our <laughs> hobby's never had that much happen at one time in one place. It could get really messed up. With the blowouts of the world saying, I'll take a thousand cases to the, the individual hobbyists will get nothing. The other problem, I hate to say this as a manufacturer, we like when our stuff trades at a premium. Mm -hmm. Now, we want to make some of that money, obviously. We love that idea, and that's what Fanatics is going to do. Yeah. But we encourage it. We put less out in the marketplace than we know the marketplace can handle because we want you to go pay 250 for that $100 box. And that's why people come to me and go, man, you killed it with that product. Of course you did. I made it scarce on purpose so that you would pay a premium for it. You did great with it. Yeah. I'm scared that when you start having collectors bidding against dealers, bidding against, mm. this could be a mess. And I think collectors lose. But I'll also bots. point out that yeah, Josh bots. is the now named as the head of the sports car division. So he's yeah. already got experience. He was walking around the show just yesterday. And it, was. it was. It was. With a hoodie, hoodie on. No, With yeah. a hoodie on. He was being yeah. incognito. Just like you did when you were walking around the shows, digging in as quietly as possible to learn more, which is really a benefit. And I'm glad to see that he's coming in as an average customer, to see what average people are doing. That's very encouraging. Okay, another note to self, get a hoodie for the next show. <laughs> <laughs> the man in the house of